Now, apologies that we didn't go live at two minutes to 11, as we had begun doing in the last few weeks, just to allow you all to time to tune in. We had a technical hitch at exactly two minutes to 11, so I'm still going to do a little bit of chit chat. Grant, that's for you just to make sure everything is working properly before the service begins. So, this is our shortest day in the Southern Hemisphere, the winter solstice, and I must say I love it when we reach this point because very quickly the days get longer than the nine and a half hours we've been having. I know for some of you in the Northern Hemisphere who watch, that still seems quite a long day. Um, but that's that's what it is here in Melbourne and for the Blackburn folk I wanted to say it's a tiny bit cold in church because of course we have to turn the heating off before we start streaming but I have my big coat to put on and the central heating wait for it central heating is being installed from tomorrow so that is some good warm news for winter solstice. And I'll hand over to Graham. Thank you, Christine, and good to be with you all this morning. Our 14th Sunday of uh, streaming uh, our service, of trying to connect while we're not together. And I uh, hope and pray that this works uh, really well for you today, wherever uh, and whatever time you're watching. But especially if you're with us live, it's great to have you along. Amanda, our, uh, one of our resident musicians, I suppose, is, uh, is still with her mother in Adelaide. And, uh, but she's taken care to send us a piece of reflective music. So we're going to begin, as we have done previously, with a little bit of Bach. And uh, I hope that you'll enjoy hearing Amanda play. She's uh, sent a very fine recording uh, to us this week. And... Uh, we hope, uh, even though she's in kind of quarantine with her mother, uh, mandatory isolation, I think it was, when she crossed the border, uh, she sent us this video, uh, Bach, Saraband, and G major. Oops. Thank you, Amanda. Shall we join together in prayer? Let us connect with our Heavenly Father as we pray. Almighty and everlasting God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we bow before you and ask that you draw us near with your presence now. 
Holy Spirit, convey the loving presence and power of the risen Lord to every heart bowed before you. Lord Jesus Christ, be known to us as the healer and rescuer of your people. Draw us by the tenderness of your passion and with the cords of love into the presence of our Heavenly Father. God of all mercy and Father of light, from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its true identity, enable us to honour you as we share together, even while apart, now in Jesus' name. Amen. Christine is going to share with us, young at heart. Well, I think you all know by now that I like stories with happy endings. I spoke about Yoti Kumari taking her disabled father safely home on the back of her bike, I think over a thousand kilometres. And last week I spoke about the rescue of William Callaghan after being two nights in the Australian bush in freezing temperatures. Well, today I'm going to share a story which is a very good story and which hasn't ended yet and may never end because, yeah, you'll see why. We've all been saddened by our increasing awareness of racism here and overseas and saddened also by the violence of some of the protesters and the apparent inability, and this is not just protesters, the apparent inability of people to have a rational discussion with people who think differently. Everything seems to so easily get angry and sometimes violent. The statistics in Australia, I have to admit, although I love Australia and I love being here, and it's especially a great place to be during the COVID-19 pandemic, but our statistics for Aboriginal incarceration and deaths in custody are disturbing, and many of us feel we have overlooked them in the 20-odd years since we had a Royal Commission into deaths in custody. So last, last week, at Monday in the car, I switched on the radio and it was a repeat of Sunday Extra from last Sunday. So to people in Melbourne, if you can listen to Sunday Extra from June the 14th on RN, it's worth the 24 minutes, but I'll just summarize. Julian Morrow was interviewing two Peters, Peter Gibbs and Peter McKenna. So I'll talk first about Peter Gibbs. You can see Peter is on the left, receiving in 2017 an award for the program I'm about to describe. But he was not always smiling. His sister Fiona died in custody 28 years ago. He didn't want violence to be her legacy. This was the second time a member of his family had been in custody. The family was, had died in custody, sorry. The whole family was angry. Peter was the oldest brother of Fiona, so he somehow felt responsible and deep, deep grief. And he battled with guilt and grief for many years. Then, 15 years ago, he had this brilliant idea which is called I Proud. He so wanted his own children and Fiona's children, so his nieces and nephews, to know that something positive had come out of Fiona's death, and it has. I Proud has been running for 15 years. 700 young Aboriginal people have, done, have gone through the program. They go through the police academy eventually, but the bar is not lowered to let them in, which Peter believes is a good thing. They do an extra six months of preparation, so they get into the police academy, those who go into the police academy, sorry, they go into the police academy, they get in at the same level as non-Aboriginal Australians. 
Not all of them have then gone into the police force, but many have, and that is being seen as a very important step throughout Australia for more Aboriginal police in the police force. Some have gone to the Australian Federal Police, so the AFP as we call it, some into the armed services, others into health and education. Peter also sees it as just general relationship building and especially he's grateful for the way his wider family's attitude to the police has changed. And this is a photograph, I think, of the 2019 I Proud Young People. So, now to the second Peter, Detective Superintendent Peter McKenna. Here he is in a photo with three young Aboriginals, Aboriginal young men. He's the commander of the Orana Midwestern Police District in New South Wales, and he is the leader of Project Wawe. I think that's how they pronounce it. Wawe means young men. The Aboriginal elders gave that name and gave their blessing to commence this project, which has been a groundbreaking police program. Police work closely with Aboriginal young people at risk in Dubbo, New South Wales. It's having remarkable results, reducing crime and forging a new level of respect between the police and the Aboriginal community. Peter said before most young Aboriginals were negative in their response to any police man or woman they saw, um, even if it was not they weren't necessarily being charged. Now they will run up to the police they recognise and give them a hug. Peter has been in the police force, not always in Dubbo. I think he's only been there for three or four years. But he's been in the police force in New South Wales for 30 years. And he said this programme has been the highlight of his career. He emphasised that they are not soft on crime. They still will arrest people committing crimes. He also said that at all the police involved in the programme say how much it has changed them. There's been a 65% reduction in the number of ab Aboriginal kids charged in the six months the programme was running before COVID. 65% reduction in charges. The PCYC, or the Police Citizens Youth Club, offers breakfast twice weekly, takes kids to school, organise fitness, organises fitness and educational programmes, has cultural education programmes where they use the leaders of the Aboriginal community. On Friday nights before COVID, 70 to 120, so it's quite a range, but it's still quite a number, even at the low end, were attending a youth club at this centre. Before this started, Friday used to be the busiest night in Dubbo for crime. It's now the second lowest. During COVID, p police involved have gone to visit the Aboriginal kids individually at their homes, taking with them, and I love this, lawnmowers, spades, rakes, and said, hey, come on, we haven't forgotten you, and we're going to clean up your garden. And so the kids work with the police cleaning up their gardens, and they're planning a camping trip, which they hope will be able to still go ahead. And now I'm going to read my notes because I want to quote exactly what people have said. Peter McKenna said, There has never been a more important time for out, us to reach out and show this communi community that we are there and that we care. That we are there and that we care. Julian Morrow, the interviewer, expressed my feelings exactly. He said, it is so good 
to hear about these two positive programmes at a time when there is so much focus on conflict and division in our community. As I listened, I thought of the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, which the Blackburn people who normally fill these seats will remember us studying, it seems, a lifetime ago. Happy are those who work for peace. God call, will call them his children. May God bless us all and help us all to be peacemakers. Oh. <laughs> yes, sorry, I did forget that in the absence of the people who usually help with the reading or have been for the last month or so, I am reading quite a long one, so you'll have to listen to me for another 20 verses. Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 to 20. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus asking, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So Jesus called a child, made him stand in front of them and said, I assure you that unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the one who humbles himself and becomes like this child. And whoever welcomes in my name one such child as this welcomes me. And then he begins talking about temptations to sin, still focusing on the child. If anyone should cause one of these little ones to sin, to lose his faith in me, it would be better for that person to have a large millstone tied around his neck and be drowned in the deep sea. How terrible for the world that there are things that make people lose their faith. Such things will always happen, but how terrible for the one who causes them. If your hand or your foot makes you lose your faith, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life without a hand or a foot than to keep both hands and both feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye makes you lose faith, take it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with only one eye than to keep both eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. And now we come to the parable of the lost sheep. See that you don't despise any of these little ones. Their angels in heaven, I tell you, are always in the presence of my Father in heaven. What do you think a man does who has 100 sheep and one gets lost? He will leave the other 99 grazing on the hillside and go and look for the lost sheep. When he finds it, I tell you, he feels far happier over this one sheep than over the 99 that did not get lost. In just the same way, your Father in heaven does not want any one of these little ones to be lost. If your brother sins against you, go to him and show him his fault. But privately, just between yourselves, if he listens to you, you have won your brother back. But if he will not listen to you, Take one or two other persons with you, so that every ac accusation may be upheld by the testimony of two or more witnesses. As the scripture says, 
And if you will not listen to them, then tell the whole thing to the church. Finally, if you will not listen to the church, treat him as though he were a pagan or a tax collector. And so I tell all of you, what you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven, and what you permit in earth, on earth will be permitted in heaven. And I tell you more. Whenever two of you on earth agree about anything you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, I am there with them. May God bless his word to us, including the difficult passages in this section. Well, thank you, Christine. We've been looking at some wayside markers in Matthew's Gospel. We've found five of them, and uh, they're like root markers. In the ancient Roman world, they had root markers. We have root markers. This is uh, the Balti Bridge in Melbourne with the signage above guiding the three lanes of traffic to the different uh, outcomes at the other side. And Ma Matthew has actually built into his Gospel five markers and they divide the teaching of Jesus into five blocks, a kind of new five books, like the five books of Moses at the beginning of the Hebrew Bible. Matthew, writing for Jewish readers, wants it to resonate with them that we have from Jesus uh, these blocks of teaching uh, which correspond in a way to the old law. Jesus is presenting his words now. And so we're looking at uh, the root markers and the ones that uh, I've identified already as at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, verse 28, when Jesus had finished these words. And later on we discover in chapter 11, verse 1, when Jesus had finished teaching his disciples. This was prior to their mission. And then in chapter 13, the middle of the Gospel, we have when Jesus had finished these parables. So that was what we looked at last week. Then today, we, as we come to chapter 19, we discover that there's a reference back to the passage Christine has just read, the whole of chapter 18, when Jesus had finished these words. And as we read on in the Gospel, as I'm hoping you might, uh, we'll discover in chapter 26, verse 1, when Jesus had finished all these words. So we're looking at root marker number 4, and we're picking up what we're hearing about chapter 18. And I'm hoping that as we think about this, we'll discover there's a new normal. There's a lot of talk about a new normal now. What's going to be new normal after COVID? Well, Jesus has a new normal, a radically new normal for his disciples. It's not what they expected. It's a kind of Christian new normal that's enduring whatever we face. And uh, I think we'll get into the substance of the chapter if we ask four questions. The first question is the one that the disciples asked, who is the greatest? So that's the first question. The second question is about the little ones. Who are these little ones? Which little ones is Jesus talking about? And then the question is a little bit oblique, but where is Jesus in all this? And then finally, the question of forgiveness. How much? How much forgiveness? So with the help of these four questions, let's try and probe some of the main ideas of the chapter. Christine has only read, of course, the first uh, 20 verses, and there are 35 verses in the chapter. So there's plenty more to consider, and I'm going to touch on the main ideas, but not open out each, sec each paragraph um, uh, fully. So first of all, who is the greatest? Well, astonishingly, uh, to our ears, uh, used to... Uh, Jesus teaching in a general sense, these words sound strange to us, even shocking, because we've been sensitized to Jesus talking about humility and meekness, gentleness, and, uh, but we need to understand the context of the question. 
Jesus appears and he's been leading a new kingdom movement. He's been talking about the kingdom of God, as it's expressed in Mark and, and uh, Luke. Matthew is writing for Jewish readers, as I've already said, and he softens this to the kingdom of heaven, not wanting to take the name of God and use it in a way that could be devalued. He uses this oblique reference, the kingdom of heaven. But it's a kingdom message that's coming through from Jesus, a new kind of kingdom. Now, if we take the period of time from 160 or 70 years before Jesus to, uh, to the year AD 120, 130, in that period of, say, 300 years, there were numerous messianic movements because the crushing oppression of Rome was such that Jewish sensitivities rebelled against it. And there were many kingdom movements, would-be messiahs who wanted to free uh, Jer Jerusalem and Israel from the, the yoke of Rome. We know just from the New Testament itself that there was a group called the Zealots. Uh, one of them was, became one of Jesus' disciples, Simon the Zealot. And so, so right inside, uh, even the inner circle of Jesus, there was this uh, group, uh, there was a, one of these representatives who had, had had these extreme ideas of nationalism, but he's being resensitized by what Jesus is teaching them. And, and, and the, the zealots actually had an, an assassination wing, if you like. Uh, it was called the Sicari. Sicari is a, a word for a, a small dagger, a small curved dagger, which could easily be concealed on one's, in one's clothing. And the Sicari murdered Roman citizens and, uh, and Jews who supported Roman citizens in crowds, they would slip away quickly, uh, having done the deed. So, so there was a, an armed movement against Rome. And some of these had measured a measure of success. For example, around the year 167, there was a group uh, called the Maccabees, a group of brothers who established an independent Jewish kingdom, for, which lasted for about 100 years. And, and then in, in the, uh, that fell apart, Herod tried to take control and work his alliance with Rome. But as late as 120 AD, there was uh, another movement uh, which was uh, known as uh, uh, the <laughs> Bar Kokhba revolt. And the Romans crushed that and uh, eventually decided to totally destroy Jerusalem. And uh, that comes into the passage that we'll be thinking about in, in the fifth wayside marker, because Jesus could see the writing on the wall. He could see what was going to happen. So Jesus appeared with a kingdom movement. And so the, the disciples were saying, well, who are going to be the, who's going to be the spokesperson for the group? Who's going to be the recruiting master? Who'll keep the minutes of our meeting? Maybe Matthew, you'll keep the minutes of our meeting. You're pretty good with shorthand. You worked in a tax booth. You had to make notes quickly. So they were wanting eminence. Who's going to be the greatest? There's 12 of us here. And Jesus said, no. No. They, they, they had to rethink. They had to learn something altogether different. Jesus brought a small child into the group. They had so much to learn. And, but I want to suggest here at this very point that it's not just the disciples who have something to learn here. We too have all kinds of ways of awarding status and recognizing people who are important in society. Wealth, power, influence, celebrity, beauty, even family connections, all rate highly. But Jesus turned our hierarchies upside down. For his disciples, there is a totally new normal. In writing about this, Eugene Peterson comments, if once we thought that the ideas and actions available to us each day are arranged in a hierarchy upwards from incidental housework, uh, working for a pay packet, to an apex of strategically important kingdom work where uh, real Christians prioritize and strategize. He said, we can think that way no longer. Jesus turned that concept on its head when he said, whoever becomes humble like a child 
like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better if you had had a millstone uh, fastened around your neck and been hurled into the depths of the sea. The greatest is the one who humbles himself. Jesus is calling for a radical adjustment to their priorities. In fact, a complete inversion of them. Children counted for little in the ancient world until they were old enough to be married or could work. Jesus is not calling for childishness, but he's calling for childlike trust and innocence. And he puts a warning here. If, the, if where the, what the disciples see with their eyes or where they go with their feet or what they touch with their hands, if these things cause them to lose faith, it would be better to lose the eye, to lose the foot, to lose the hand. Now, this is hyperbole. Tragically, it's not always been recognized as hyperbole. When I worked at Scotch College, I used to show a film uh, about the average. It was uh, produced uh, by one of the, the men who was part of the uh, Royal Commission into Abor Aboriginal Deaths in custody back in the 90s. And it was called Who Killed Malcolm Smith? It's the story about a man who, who taken from his family as a child, uh, was slowly institu institutionalized over his lifetime and ended up uh, committing suicide in jail. And the question was, who killed him? And you could see as you watched the story how the hopelessness and the, uh, the life that he lived overwhelmed him despite several moments when he could have, he felt he was on the cusp of something better. But the system worked against him again and again. Uh, if you can find that, that video, I suggest you should look at it. Who Killed Malcolm Smith, uh, a tale worth uh, knowing. But Jesus' point here is that we can do things that will kill faith and hope and love, and we need to be very strict about them. So who is the greatest? But then the question is, which little ones? We noticed uh, earlier in chapter 10 that a cup of cold water to the least of these little ones is as done unto Jesus himself. And Jesus now enlarges on this idea. He's saying that children matter enormously to God. And he tells us that the angels of these little ones, this is an interesting expression, the angels of these little ones constantly behold the face of the Father in heaven. So who are they? Well, from the start of the teaching on the Beatitudes, which Christine alluded to earlier, Jesus has made it clear that the subjects of his concern and his kingdom include weak, vulnerable children, of course, but they also include those who are weak and vulnerable at other times of life. Cripples, the chronically sick, the elderly and the infirm, refugees, women in many cultures, and any who find themselves on the human scrap heap that our world throws people onto when it can't think of what to do with them, says Tom Wright. He's, he goes on to say, they include the dirty beggar you avoided in the street yesterday. They include the shop girl who you, whom you were tempted to be rude to. They include the old woman pushing the supermarket trolley down the street with her life's uh, belongings piled high. They include the teenage boy who drifted into drugs because there weren't any jobs and perhaps is now dying of heroin. All those we pass by in the street and screen out. We hide our faces from them. We don't want to know about certain... I think about getting off uh, the metro station at Parliament, going up the steps, and uh, numerous times when I've gone to meetings in the city, there's been a homeless person right there, and in the rush hour crowd, we just all file past him. We screen him out. One day, I went up, and there was somebody hunkered down beside him, talking to him. And I just felt so glad that that person was doing that. And I wondered why I'd never done it myself. So these people that we screen out 
God wants them in his intimate presence. Think about that. How do we know that? Well, in Isaiah, and we need to remember that Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Daniel have been looming large in Jesus' mind throughout this gospel. In, uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, we're told that the seraphim uh, have six wings, and with two they cover their feet, and with two they fly, and with two they cover their face, because they cannot look on the divine presence. The radiance of God is such that they screen their vision, they screen the Father from their view. But the angels of the little ones, Jesus tells us right here, they don't have to do that. He says they're in a different category altogether. Their angels constantly behold the Father's face. I think that's very powerful. For this reason, causing a little one to stumble from the faith is deadly dangerous to the perpetrator. So we need to ask, who do we choose not to see? The homeless, the colored, the refugee, the elderly? Take care who you screen out from, from your view. Jesus says the shepherd searches and cares for the wayward sheep. Each one matters to him. We need to bear that in mind. So that's the little ones. More than we might, we might think. And it challenges us day by day. And I feel that challenges, I'm sure you do. But the third question is, where is Jesus? Jesus' inversion of attitude and concern creates a whole new kind of community. And it's a community envisioned 500 years before by the prophet Jeremiah in a passage which I often refer to when I'm talking to couples who want to get married. Jeremiah 31, 31 uh, through 34. And this community is a covenant community in a relationship with God. And Jeremiah discusses it as being like a husband uh, with his people, that God was the bridegroom, as it were, and his people are his bride. And this is the blueprint of God's family, which Paul talks about in Ephesians as well the one from whom every family derives its true identity. In any well-functioning family, harmony is a high priority. So Jesus provides guidelines for resolving conflict and promoting reconciliation and harmony within the community. If there's hurt between members, then a phased series of steps can be taken to promote reconciliation. And Christine read this passage to us about the brother who sins. Go privately to your brother, said Jesus. And if that doesn't resolve it in a person-to-person -person con con uh, um, con conversation, then take one or two witnesses and, and, and have a brotherly conference about this. And if, there's, if the issue cannot be resolved, then, then bring it to the community, the church community, and say, look, we're having trouble sorting this out. Please help us with this. Now, there are great guiding principles here uh, for conflict resolution and for restorative justice. And we need to be conscious of this, especially in the Christian community, and not just hive off and say, well, I can't get on with them. I'm doing my, my own thing my own way. To work for reconciliation is exactly what Jesus is prioritizing. Where reconciliation is absent or unsought, we may assume that the Lord Jesus has absented himself. That's exactly what he says. When you do this, I'm in the midst. But the implication is, if you're not doing it, I'm not there either. As we pursue reconciliation and forgiveness, the Lord Jesus is present in our church communities. Well, how much of a priority is this? How much forgiveness well, Peter is pretty struck by all of this. And he asks that question, how many times? I mean, you've got, you go once, you go twice, you go, bring it to the church three times, four times, seven times, how much? And Jesus says that famous response, until 70 times seven. Jesus is saying, if you're counting, then you haven't understood the point I'm making here at all. And he tells a parable and the parable is perhaps more obvious than some of the ones we looked at in chapter 13. 
He tells a parable about a king who forgave a servant an unpayable debt. And afterwards, that servant imprisoned a man who owned, oh, who owed him a tiny fraction of what he himself had been forgiven. Now Jesus says, imagine how the king would feel. What would that king do? And Jesus says, what do you imagine there? That is what your heavenly father will do unless you forgive your brother from your heart. So what is forgiveness like? Well, it's been part of the story right the way through. From that first chunk of Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, 6 and 7, we have the prayer of the Lord Jesus, which we will pray shortly, and in it forgiveness is a priority. And he even appends a note about forgiveness. If you don't forgive others, then your Heavenly Father won't forgive you because it's obvious you haven't even understood about forgiveness. Forgiveness isn't like a letter of commendation or a certificate that you can hang on the wall and say, I've got this. No, it's not something you can file away for future use. Rather, it's more like the kiss of life. Unless you breathe it out, you can't take it in. But as you pass it on to others, it becomes your life-giving breath. You experience the forgiveness of the Father and you breathe it out to others. Shortly, a few chapters further on, and we'll touch on it in the next few weeks, Jesus comes back to this passage about Jeremiah and the cost of forgiveness in words that we know very well. He says in chapter 26, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus was on the road to Jerusalem when he's teaching his disciples. The price of forgiveness was weighing heavily on him. It was the road he chose to tread. To you and me, multiplied forgiveness is freely available. But for him, it could not have cost more. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we confess we are increasingly aware of how much we think of ourselves and how little we think of others. Heavenly Father, we know you have us in your heart and in Jesus you have revealed your mission to rescue and redeem us by taking the lowliest of places. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Please grant to us the same ability to love and show real concern for all others, irrespective of their race, religion, colour, class or status. We are grateful that the government of Victoria has taken further steps to suppress the spread of COVID-19, putting a clear priority on the life and health of the whole community. Help us with patience to play our part and to support and encourage others who may be struggling to cope because of the demands of isolation and loneliness are more difficult and impose pressures on the emotional well-being and mental health of families. As the school holidays approach in our state, we pray for the safety of all families with school-aged children. May kids be sheltered from the harshest aspects of the pandemic and find simple and even screen-free joys in everyday things. Please grant wisdom to governments shaping fiscal policy and success to job seekers looking to regain employment. Again, we pray for the research teams working hard to develop treatments and cures for COVID-19. May the results of their labours come to fruition soon and the blessings flow on to as many as possible. We remember in many places the pandemic remains unsuppressed and we pray for all who are left with sorrow, grief and loss. 
as many want to erect walls to divide nation from neighbour. Help us as disciples of Jesus to build bridges of hope and healing. We come to you in words the Lord Jesus has taught us, saying together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amanda will play a short reflection before we close with the benediction. Thank you, Amanda. Very beautiful. Let us pray. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you and with those whom you love and indeed with all the family of God, now and always. Amen.